Okay. So our second speaker today is uh, the Reflections of Ambiguous Realities. Okay. Um, oh. uh, I won't be reading, I just need this for my uh, state of mind. Um, uh, I would like to welcome everyone. Um, I want to thank the InnoGP for letting us, uh, Zami, uh, Freaks this is a good word, I think, uh, to talk about him because he is of utmost importance, not just to us, but to theater history in general, I believe. Um, just a word about me. Um, I'm, I'm at the Department of Aesthetics at Tischlerhorn University. I'm a PhD student, so uh, keep that in mind. Um, and uh, beside this, I'm a theater dramaturg as well, so I do artistic work in theater. And what interests me in Zami especially is his uh, view toward practice when writing about uh, his theater form. And uh, what I brought for you today uh, with this very uh, interesting title, which came to me in a moment of inspiration and then led me to run after it because it seemed much better than what I've got afterwards, uh, but it's a good title, I think, um, is that... Uh, measuring my time, is that what's really important on a theater stage is a common ground with the audience, between the actors, between the artists, the playwright, and those viewing the performance. And uh, what gave me the idea of, writing, of talking about Aristotle's mimesis and Zami's monomane is how this common ground can be found in a performance, and what different types of approaches these two people made towards theater. Um, what I want to start out with is that uh, ever since the 19th century, Western theater has been, how uh, is defined by its relationship to realism or to the world. Uh, it started out with naturalism at the end of the 19th century. Uh, Ibsen, uh, Chekhov, and so on come to mind, uh, where the main goal of uh, theater was to somehow reproduce reality on stage, to forget the difference between the stage and the outside world and somehow blend these two things together. After that came the theaters of the avant-garde, which uh, said, no, we don't want any connection to reality. We want to reflect on reality in a different way. And in the second half of the 20th century, we got performance art, which was about how the performer uh, sacrifices their own life. Uh, and damage themselves in a performance to minimize the distance again. It's always this fluctuation has been problematic. And um, when we talk about, for example, documentary theater, it relies on how we talk about our real reality uh, like news or uh, somehow bring reality into theater, not by stylization, but by topic. And uh, when I started thinking about imitation, I realized that it's such a basic component of any type of art. It's all about how, what kind, how we can communicate with those enjoying the art itself. We need some type of common language. And when we start out, is use objects from reality, reproduce them in some way, so we can have a common language in the art itself. And uh, this is what I'm going to be talking about today. Um, what's interesting is that the highly stylized nature of Eastern or Far Eastern theaters don't have this type of dia diatomic problem. Uh, they don't think about it as a problem like we do. And uh, I'm going to think about a bit about how this is possible and why it is so. Uh, one possible way that we can um, actually I think, try to um, find out is the difference between the basic metaphysical thinking of the East and the West, about how West, uh, the Western arts uh, strive toward permanence and eternity, while Eastern arts uh, are all about dynamism and transitory uh, reality. And when we're thinking about art, we have to keep this in mind, uh, because I believe the problem stems from this difference. Okay, so this is just uh, to start out with. Uh, of course, if I want to somehow compare Aristotle and Zami, I have to keep in mind the two theaters that they wrote about. 
of course. Aristotle wrote about Greek tragedy, um, and Zami wrote about no. And when we're comparing them, we have to compare their theaters as well. This is highly problematic from a couple of different viewpoints, but it does seem fruitful uh, in a lot of different ways as well. The problems with it are, of course, uh, easy to define, um, immense distances in space and time, uh, different historical backgrounds of the two theaters, a uh, totally different type of audience, you know. Of course, Greek tragedy had the entire polis watching the performance, while no theater was a theater for the aristocratic and noble and samurai uh, of the shogunate. Very different type of culture in both of these audiences, which means different ways of communication are necessary between artists and audience members. Uh, another problem is that we don't know as much about how Greek tragedy was performed actually. While we can visit no productions to this day, the, these productions might not completely <coughs> resemble what Zami's theater looked like. It, it has changed, presumably, since his work. But still, there is a continuity that we can depend on when thinking about it. And of course, the most important, which I have run afoul of, uh, in a conference not so long ago, is that how we can compare two theaters that we cannot in any way prove to be connected philologically. How can we only work with analogies? And uh, this is a problem that needs to be addressed, I think. But uh, as one of my sources uh, says, uh, most of you might be familiar with uh, Maya J. Smethurst's works on comparing Greek tragedy and no drama. Uh, textual analysis she has been doing for many years now, and she has two books, one about Mugen no or Phantasmal no, uh, how uh, primitive Greek tra tragedy like uh, Aeschylus says um, uh, Persians can be uh, compared with uh, Zami Sanemori, for example, as uh, primitive or rudimentary dramaturgies or uh, her newer work, about two years ago, I think it came out, about uh, comparing Greek tragedy and Genzai no, or uh, Phenomenal no, um, which has a more intense plot. In it, for example, she compares Shunkan and Philoctetes, uh, two very similar stories um, with two very different theater forms. I think her work can be the basis of a type of thinking in analogies when we can use either of these theater forms to think about the other. Uh, I think that's an interesting experiment. And the reason that I do think that these two uh, theater forms can be compared is a lot of elements in them that are very similar. Um, they have similar sources, uh, they are li using literary texts, uh, they have sacred ritualistic backgrounds, for example. Both are highly stylized theater forms. This will be very important for us later. They have all male casts, uh, they're based on song, uh, music, mm -hmm. and dance, and they have chorus uh, parts in them as well, and of course, masks. I brought a picture of, this is the Dionysus the Theater, I think, in Athens, and most of you might know this, uh, this is a nice place uh, in the world. Uh, this is uh, Miyajima, I think, uh, and the No Theater there. And I also brought some pictures of Greek masks in performance and uh, uh, an old mask that everybody should uh, know. Uh, it's an anime and everything like that, so uh, they use it a lot. Um, we know this as well. Okay, so a bit about uh, mimesis. Uh, I don't want to talk about this for a long time because I think most of us know what <laughs> mimesis is. Uh, what I brought for you today is the very basics that uh, can be used when we're comparing uh, Aristotle and Zami. Uh, Aristotle writes in his Poetics at length about mimesis, and he bases it, his, uh, uh, how should I say this, um, theory on it, on the basic joy of imitation people exhibit, even as children, uh, the joy of uh, um, imitating something else, and uh, especially in art, of course, and the joy of recognizing something when we uh, read something or look at a depiction uh, or see a performance. Uh, Aristotle, um, how should I say this, uh, categorizes art uh, 
in, in the poetics based on what is imitated, how it is imitated, and with what tools this imitation is done. Uh, when he's talking about tragedy as is his main point uh, in the first part of the poetics, uh, he uses a drama text-centered approach. He concentrates on the author, author's work, not on the actors or the performance, and defines drama, both comedy and tragedy, as an imitation of action, of how a character acts, what reason they act, their will in action. And uh, in this way, emphasizes plot, or this is a simplified uh, translation plot, of course, but uh, it's used in most texts, or mythos. Um, in Hungarian, it's mesha. Mesha means in Hungarian a story, fairy tale. It's very interesting, the different connotations. But I'm using plot here and um, says, writes that plot takes precedence over character when writing a play. And this, se this seems, and now I'm talking as a, a theater maker actually, contraintuitive because characters create their own story, don't they? The, the author just goes after the character. While Aristotle writes, no, the story has precedence because you cannot you can write an interesting story with weak characters, but you cannot necessarily write a good story with strong characters by themselves. You need to somehow uh, um, link the characters together. And this connecting of characters is plot itself. This is why he says that plot should have precedence. Um, his main goal in uh, this part of the poetics is somehow defining tragedy. Uh, he uses uh, the uh, concept of catharsis, which, which is vaguely defined in the work, uh, the release of pity and fear, elos and phobos, uh, at the end of a performance uh, through the imitation of action. This is important for us because even though he bases his um, concept of tragedy on plot uh, he, and a very rational linking of events, uh, he reaches an emotional uh, effect in the end, which will be important for us later. Uh, this is just uh, 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 one of the problems I talked about, that we don't know much about performances. And this is, of course, uh, Oedipus uh, and his meeting with the Sphinx. Um, we don't have pictures of a performance, but we do have a picture of the story, the plot, in a way. Well, uh, in opposition to Aristotle, Zami's monomana isn't about plot, but about character. Uh, Andrew Parkin, in a very exciting analysis of uh, Zami and Aristotle, writes that Zami uh, he writes about imitation of things. Uh, I believe it's actually an imitation of emotions, and I'm going to try to uh, explain what I mean by that. Um, Zami's writing is, of course, mainly performance and character-oriented, focusing on the work of the actor as opposed to the work of the writer, uh, especially in Fushikan. He has texts like Sando, for example, about writing uh, no texts, of course, but most of his teachings, uh, his hidden, are about uh, the work of the actor. And uh, I brought just a couple of thoughts from Fushikaden, which I think are interesting for us. Uh, this is the text where he talks about um, monomane at length. Uh, one of his thoughts, and he starts his analysis with this, is a comprehensive uh, imitation is the key to a performance of an actor. Uh, this seems strange for us, because if anybody has ever seen any no performances, know that uh, there's not a lot of... Uh, realistic acting on stage. It doesn't seem comprehensive in any way. Um, then he, <laughs> he writes that, of course, the degree of the imitation has to uh, be taken into account. And strangely enough, writes that uh, the imitation can be, um, the source of the imitation can be a courtier, a nobleman, people of high birth or high rank, uh, cultured characters and should not be imitated are characters that are very rustic or uh, roguish or negative. 
which is strange because if you want, if you think about uh, imitation, you do not think about what type of characters can be imitated. Another problem, uh, for example, in Sando, he writes that uh, when composing a no play, one should choose a character that is possible to be depicted in no. And as a criteria for this, he says that he writes that you have to choose a character when composing a play that can sing and dance. Where it's logical that the character <coughs> sings and dances on stage, which is another strange precept if you think about it. Uh, uh, you can only choose characters that are capable of being depicted in this way. What this brings me to a main point is that in no, the form of the theater, that the beauty of the form of the actor takes precedence over the imitation the actor does. So Zami writes that you have to imitate characters that are of high birth because those characters that you can copy when you go to the Imperial Palace or every, everywhere else, um, walk and talk and act in the way that a no actor should act on stage, refined, aristocratic. And the goal of your imitation isn't to reproduce them wholly, but their surface. This is a very interesting concept, I think, because uh, the no production itself, the performance itself, should have a sense of grace, of elegance, which is why uh, lower themes are uh, relegated to Kyogen, for example. Um, which brings me to my point that the extern external form of character is important to somehow project an, a sense of beauty and a sense of Hana, as we heard just uh, not so long ago. But the work of the actor has to be on emotion instead internal emotion. And for me, this is the paradox of no that is extremely interesting. Because uh, you don't, uh, the, the no actor does not act out their emotion, they suppress their emotion. They suppress the realism of their characters, and by doing so, express the emotion, sending it <coughs> to the audience uh, for, um, uh, for them to contemplate and recognize to use the words of Aristotle. Mm. Another interesting thing, just to um, make this more uh, in um, um, interesting, I think, for example, is when you watch no performance, uh, you must know about kata, the various movements a no actor makes that somehow resemble realistic movements, but are not the movements themselves, of course, crying and not crying, as uh, uh, in a basic uh, Western theater, arts can be uh, depicted like this. They use a highly stylized movement in no. And this is another part of this suppression that I'm talking about, uh, the stylization of theater that uh, has a bigger role for the audience in the interpretation of the performance. Uh, as we said before, I think it's important that the audience Feedback is very important in a performance, especially in Zami's text. He writes at length about how an actor must look to the audience, think about the audience's reaction, uh, modulate their acting if someone came, comes late to a performance and so on. Um, this um, communication with the audience is also important because um, imitation, their work, uh, in monomane has to be adjusted um, according to this. And uh, actually, uh, I wrote in my abstract about Kakyo as well, another of his important texts that we uh, heard about a bit uh, before. Uh, it's very interesting how he has uh, various precepts in his other texts about acting uh, methods for no actors. For example, there's one about how what is felt as ten uh, in the soul has to be acted as seven. Once again, suppression. Through suppression and stylization, something else is, uh, it, uh, I think it's a morbid term, but the emotion bleeds out of the performance, in a sense. Um, the audience can recognize it and find joy in this imitation. Um, okay. 
these are pictures I think most of you know this. This is Matsukadze, one of the most important uh, works of Zami. Uh, I just brought how I love putting these pictures together to show us the continuity of no. This is a performance from a couple of years ago to depictions from the 19th, uh, 20th and the, I think uh, 18th century of the same topic. This continuity is of course very important when thinking about uh, the differences between Aristotle and Zami and the way they write. Uh, which brings me to my conclusion. Uh, this is a, of course a summary of what I've said before. Uh, Aristotle is mimesis in plot or external action of character. Uh, it's a much more rational type of thinking and uh, thinking of the author itself. While Zami is mo in, in the monomane contributes to character. It's an emotional or internal action of a character. And uh, what I find extremely interesting here is that, which is of course very basic, is that Aristotle is a theoretician, is a philosopher, viewing his theater from the outside, coming to um, a theory of imitation by doing so, while Zami is a practitioner of theater, uh, gazes to the actor. Uh, how, what does this uh, imitation work look or feel like from within a performance? And uh, what I find paramount in this comparison is that in both theater forms, and this is important, uh, imitation is a tool for, uh, to create common ground where the audience can understand the main point of the performance, either this way or the, uh, either by looking at people exerting their wills, uh, coming into conflict and thus releasing emotion as in the case of Greek tragedy, or in the case of Zami and No, about mm -hmm. depicting emotion, not plot, about depicting character, and somehow coming to a new type of emotion that the audience and the actor can share uh, during the performance. And I think uh, it's very important when we talk about art and theater arts in, uh, spe specifically, that somehow we can get from the actors on stage to the audience watching the performance. And the way that we reach from one to the other is the main point of mimesis and monomane, I think. Uh, uh, these are some of the texts I tried using, and uh, uh, I want to thank you for your attention.